panel conversation. So don't be shy. Thank you. See, these fine people are taking the lead. Um, my name is Rebecca Peterson. I'm the Senior Research Manager for HarvardX at Harvard University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our inaugural lightning round at the Learning with MOOCs conference, our workshop. Um, this is an experimental format. As you see on your program, we have eight different research presentations to deliver in the span of 60 minutes, um, featuring full conversation with all of you. And to achieve that goal, each of our presenters will get three minutes to give you an overview of the research that they're doing. And you'll quickly find that the research being presented today by our colleagues is very diverse in the space, so it's very exciting. Um, our, my colleagues here in the front row, our presenters are here up front. They're going to stick to a quick, three, a really tight three-minute rule so we can get through um, all of their presentations, so we can allow ample time at the end for full group discussion. So I realize along the way many of you may have con um, questions. Please note them and hold on to those so we can get through the presentations. After that, um, everyone will join us up here for a panel conversation with the rest of you about the state of research. And given the morning conversations and the sessions, I expect it to be lively and far-ranging. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to Carolyn Rosé from Carnegie Mellon University, who's going to start us off today. Thank you, Carolyn. Hi there. Um, so uh, I will be talking about uh, our research on exploring social factors that impact persistence in MOOCs. Um, in addition to doing a variety of analyses over many um, MOOCs, uh, to find these so social factors that uh, uh, are associated with attrition. We've also been developing technology for interventions to improve the social climate in MOOCs, and we have technology to share. That's the take-home message. This research that we've been doing is based on um, a history of doing research in online communities more generally, and I want to acknowledge some of my colleagues from CMU and also the University of Pittsburgh. This is uh, an example analysis from an online medical support community where we see how important it is to receive informational and emotional support in maintaining um, commitment to a community. And you'll see a couple of these survival curves in, um, in my talk where we see time of participation in the x-axis, probability of still being involved on the y-axis, this black line is average attrition, and those top two lines, which are more shallow, show the impact of having received a high amount of informational and emotional support. So you can see how important that has been. And we see similar patterns across MOOCs when we look at students who participate in the discussions. In particular, we can differentiate students based on how interconnected they are in those discussions. And um, so here, the blue lines are sort of average attrition um, of those students. And you can see the yellow line, which is far more shallow, is students who have an above average number of connections, persistent connections. And when those connections start to drop out, that's uh, where the, the red line is. So students, when they lose their support, also tend to drop out. So we see here evidence that students benefit from having some support to keep them involved in the course. And we've been developing technology to um, help students find those supportive others. So some students are less good at finding those connections. Some students have questions, and they don't get answered, and they get frustrated, and they leave. Confusion is um, a factor that we have found that uh, as students are exposed to a lot of other confused students or as they express confusion themselves, that's associated with them dropping out. But it, we think if we can help them find the need, the, their needed support, um, then we can have an impact on their experience, on their learning, and also their persistence. So my student, Dee Young, has been developing some social recommendation algorithms to try to do a global optimization over a community to match up help seekers with help providers. We have also done, um, uh, over many years, studies of computer-supported collaborative learning, and we see how valuable interaction is in that context. We have tools um, that uh, can support that effectively and can be integrated easily into MOOCs. And um, I'm almost out of time. But the idea really is that if we can have these affordances built in, we can help to address the problem that teachers have limited resources for offering the support that students need.
it's probably not. Is it mirror? Or is it it was. Yeah. We'll clear it now. Okay. That's just fine. We'll check it out. Okay. Yeah, hi. We're um, Tim and Lara from Iversity. Iversity is a European MOOC platform. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so we're Tim and Lara from Iversity, and Iversity is a European MOOC platform. There's not only Future Learn out there. <laughs> so, and um, yeah, on our platform, whenever professors want to do an exam that cannot be evaluated automatically, they basically can choose between three different ways of um, evaluation. And first of all, they can do it themselves, would be professor grading. Most of the time, they don't have the time to do this. So what do they do? They go for a second option. They choose peer grading. That means um, participants evaluating each other, but some do not really trust peer grading, so they say, mm, I need something different, and then we offer pro grading, and pro grading is that we hire a small group of PhD candidates that do the um, evaluation for them, and um, Tim and I, we were really interested in finding out and how good are um, pros and peers in imitating uh, professor's grading, so um, we applied all of the three methods um, to one of our exams in one course, and we're happy to share all of our findings with you. But now we're just going to give you one graph, two results, and one question for further discussion. So, yeah, that's uh, according to the recommendations. There's one hero graph. Um, it's basically showing, yeah, you can see it. It's basically showing um, the grades given to our exam takers. Um, yeah, the grades range from the from zero to four, and um, the graders range from the peer graders, um, the pro graders, and the professor graders. Um, yeah, that's the graph. Now the two results. Um, the first result is quite obvious from the graph and probably not surprising everyone. It's that um, peers, so fellow students, um, just like good grades. So they um, like um, giving three and four. And um, yeah, and on the other hand, the um, professor and the um, pro graders, um, they already have a quite balanced uh, distribution in their grading. Um, the second result, um, what you can't see from this graph, is um, actually that the correlation between the um, pro grading, so the grading of the higher PhDs, and the professor is, uh, at the professor grade is as weak as the correlation between the um, peer grading and the professor grading. So to answer Laura's question, um, yeah, the, um, the, the higher PhDs um, kind of failed in imitating the um, professor grade um, um, in the same way as the, as the peers do. So, um, yeah, that's it. Now the um, question for the audience. Um, yeah, it's kind of a um, learning theory question. So is there such a, such a thing as a true grade? Or um, should, we, should we forget this idea? Um, probably most of you already have answers in mind, and we would be happy to um, have a conversation on that. So thanks for your attention. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chad Evans. I'm a, <clears throat> a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. This is Nicole Wang, a Penn Research Fellow. Um, the title of our presentation is Big Data and MOOCs. This uh, presentation is based on some research that we've been conducting on the Coursera uh, course-taking patterns. Um, and we wanted to share with you four problems and as, as well some solutions to these problems that we've experienced while doing this analysis. Um, the, uh, the first problem that we experienced related to the processing time with the big data that we were working with, uh, computers are generally great with calculations, but when you're working with hundreds of thousands of rows of data, it can cause some serious problems, and this affected our data cleaning, data management, and our data analysis itself. The second problem that we experienced related to the limited resources we felt that were available for us. Uh, many of our team has, uh, were, were neophyte research assistants, um, some with no experience in coding, and um, we weren't confident that there are good places to acquire and share information in regards to MOOC research. The third problem we experienced related to the, the, the ambiguous uh, nature of the data that we were given from Coursera. Uh, we were essentially handed uh, a data dump and, and then we were, uh, the variable names and a lot of the data inside of it were not exactly clearly explained to us when we were, we were basically um, making some guesses as to what things meant and when that happens we couldn't always use all the data that was there. And then the final uh, issue that we experienced related to uh, secure server issues. 
um, you know, personal information now needs to be uh, analyzed on these secure environments. And uh, we had lots of problems with cursor freezing and with the, the program uh, dropping, uh, freezing, uh, as well as some functionality lost in the computer. Nicole? Okay, so instead of being panic, we call for the openness of codes and the data analysis to contribute to future data uh, research. So we are considering building a MOOC data, a MOOC data collaborative and community or assisting whoever is currently building it and the share codes to the public to assist other researchers um, with like their analysis under the secure server. So the idea of sharing the research, ana research analysis would be beneficial in terms of the MOOC development. And the next one would be to create a data, to create a, a data dictionary. So the idea of a standardized coding system w that covers most of the variables names would be beneficial. The third, instead of like the, the big data, so the future research requires better data, uh, yet, okay, I'm running out of time. So the first one would be, so we are not IT staff, so the communication with the technology team will be the key here. So we're Richard's team and funding questions. Thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Tiffany, and I'll be presenting Iran Zhao and Andrew Ho's research on evaluating the flipped classroom in an undergraduate Chinese history survey course. Um, so what is a flipped classroom? A flipped classroom refers to a, a, um, a, a, a model that allows students to learn course content traditionally delivered in the classroom, in our case, um, uh, traditionally, de sorry, traditionally delivered in a classroom prior to the class, in our case on the edX platform online, um, so that students can spend time engaging in um, engaging active learning activities in class, um, in our case, in a discussion format um, with cold calling involved. Um, so the mo motivation behind this study was to understand whether students preferred the flipped classroom and um, if they were more motivated based on the flipped classroom, and more importantly, if it impacted their learning. So it was a quasi-experimental design comparing the, uh, the class taught in 2011 with the class, and it was a traditional class, with the class taught in 2013 as a flipped classroom, keeping the midterm fixed um, and uh, controlling for differences in rate of stringency, GPA, and SAT scores. Um, and a survey was also administered to the um, 2013 students um, to understand their opinion about the flipped classroom model. So in the results, across a range of specifications, the model suggests that there were no statistically significant difference in the midterm exam scores. Um, however, with the survey results, we found that a larger percent of students preferred the flipped classroom um, then prefer the traditional classroom um, compared, and those, compared to those who had no preference. And in the open-ended responses, we found that those who prefer the flipped classroom uh, did so because they liked the short segmented lecture content online, they liked that there were more diverse opinions presented in discussion than in a lecture, and um, that they could sort of choose when to watch the lectures. And for those who prefer the traditional classroom, they felt that there was too much time required spent outside of classroom, um, that the cold calling was highly stressful, and um, that uh, they preferred lecture in general to, um, um, uh, to discussion. 
Um, so our recommendations are that this design should be implemented more broadly to track the impact of flipped classrooms and also just to track longitudinally um, improvement in learning in general. Um, and this could be either using a pool of assessments or um, low stake assessments to track uh, learning improvements over time. Um, and also because the flipped classroom and blended learning is still in its nascent stages, um, more thought needs to be put into the implementation of it and that students' expectations should be made explicit to them since this is very new for them as well. Um, thank you, and uh, for more information, please what, read the paper that they wrote and also Jenny Burgon's report on blended learning. Um, thank you. Who's next? Sharif? 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 Okay. Yes. So you have two. Which one do you want? Can you not? It doesn't matter. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Sharif. I'm a graduate student in the Learning Analytics Lab at Stanford. And we are one of the many groups that are trying to study and understand dropouts and try to uh, mitigate attrition in MOOCs through intervention. Uh, so we view this as a four-step process. Uh, so first, you have to predict who is going to drop out. And then you have to try to identify the relevant latent factors that contribute to a learner's uh, dropout. And then you have to also identify the causes that, you know, that develop such risk factors. And then finally, you know, with this sort of knowledge, you have to try to design and deliver an intervention in a, in a timely manner. Uh, so we've done some previous work on step one, which is predicting dropout. So, you know, you can refer to the Lytics lab at stanford.edu page for that. Uh, we are moving to the next step now. So after we have used the output predictor to red flag students who are believed to be at high risk of dropout, the question now is why? Uh, so the study that I'm presenting today consists of two parts. The first part is a survey that we sent in. Actually, it's just in one course so far. We are planning to repeat it in a number of other courses. So the survey basically has two goals. The first is to identify relevant risk factors or latent factors such as, you know, experience difficulty or lack of volition, for instance. Try to identify the relevant latent factors that contribute to a student's choice to drop out and also try to you know, to source from students what they believe contributed to their dropout in terms of actual physical reasons that are measurable to us. And so some of the interesting findings that we got out is that there are mainly five uh, latent factors that explained almost 99% of the dropout. So out of these difficulty, lack of, lack of motivation, and lack of volition, which is a work habit a negative work habit where a person does not mobilize their motivation to actually do work turned out to be you know, some of the most common reported uh, factors. Uh, risk factors were basically used rating because it's difficult for students to understand the constructs and distinguish between them. Whereas the uh, reasons why these risk factors were developed, these were actually left as open-ended for students to report on their, you know, what they believe contributed to, to the development of the risk factor. So we also observed lack of time as one of the um, uh, significant uh, contributors and also lack of social support as one of the significant uh, reasons for dropout. Uh, difficulty was, you know, manifested itself in many ways, such as difficulty understanding the, co the, the, the content or students would often report that teachers would progress so fast from concept to concept without offering uh, sufficient uh, practice. Uh, among forms of lack of volition, students re reported, for instance, that since this is not something that they are, you know, pressured to do, then they would have loved to be encouraged more to do it. You know, just some, uh, these are just a few findings. And because I'm writing, running out of time, the second part of the study was to try to search for behaviors predictive of the different, you know, state of different latent factors. What we found is that, you know, by looking at students' engagement with assessments, videos, it's possible to identify features characteristic for highly motivated students, students with high volition, students experiencing difficulty. We found that by combining these in, you know, in simple machine learning models, it's possible to distinguish students who left, leave because of lack of volition, for instance, from students who leave because of difficulty, from students who leave uh, because of lack of time. Out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, my name is Megan Morrissey, and this is, you've already met my colleague, Tiffany Wong, and I wanted to acknowledge Junjia Liu. And we make up three-fourths of our China X uh, course team at Harvard X. And our motivation for uh, this study was to better understand text length on learning in an online context due to the importance of reading, um, in humanity courses, and the lack of research in this area. Uh, our course, China X, um, requires that our learners be able to analyze and um, concept, uh, contextualize um, primary and secondary sources, primarily textual, um, in order to study history. Um, as practitioners, um, as practitioners, it's important for us uh, to um, base our creation of course content on research. ChinaX is made up of 10 um, mini courses uh, that span 15 months, and each mini course is four to eight weeks, um, four to eight, four to eight weeks long. Um, and due to the large quantity of um, due to the large quantity of reading in um, specifically the fourth mini course, Transform transforming government, transforming society through government, um, and our subsequent mini courses, we really wanted to optimize text length. Um, and to better understand what would um, work the best for our learners. Um, and also in line with Harvard X's three goals of reach, research, and um, recirculation to residential, um, we are constantly trying to improve and iterate on, um, in the most immediate, our online classroom and um, residential um, blended classroom, as well as to the broader learning community. And now Tiffany is going to talk you through um, the experimental design of our study. So we had um, an A-B experimental design where um, learners were randomly assigned to group A or group B um, when they clicked on the reading. Um, for group A, they would get all the text in one segment. And for group B, they would get the text in shorter chunks. Um, so on the platform, it looks like this. Learners have to scroll for group A. And for group B, it's they have to click through the um, segments. And so we found that there was no significant difference um, in terms of correlation between text length and uh, assessments me uh, measured um, like through a certification rate, answer rates, and um, their correct answer. And uh, we measured reten we wanted to measure um, learning through um, measured by assessments and the uh, um, retention measured by completion of text and completion of the course as a whole. And we found that um, in terms of the learning, there was no sort of significance. Um, and this is also the same, uh, reflected in other studies done on textual um, physical readings. And um, in terms of the um, in terms of reten uh, retention, Learners spent more time on um, in group B, but that may be just because of click time. And um, a fraction, a larger proportion of learners finished uh, the readings in group A, but that also may be because we could only measure click time. Um, so in conclusion, we believe that more research needs to be done on this topic, and we are very open to collaboration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rene Kazocic from the Lytics Lab at Stanford. This is Emily Schneider, also from the same lab. Uh, we'll be giving a, a quick overview of the things that we've been doing in the, in the past two, two and a half years, uh, instead of going into much depth for any one of them. So I've been working on understanding learners more, especially by looking at their behaviors and courses, uh, as well as looking what motivations, uh, what motivations drives them to the courses, and also what their subsequent actions are then like. So it's a, more observational uh, analysis. We're doing this with Emily and some other collaborators. Another line of uh, work has been on promoting learner success uh, using psychological interventions, specifically using goal interventions that helps learners foster commitment and striving toward their goals, uh, and also feelings of social belonging, feeling like they, that the online learning environment is a place that, that, that they belong in. A third line of, of work is social factors in MOOCs 
many, many MOOC platforms uh, have uh, rather few social opportunities for learners to engage in. And so some things I've been looking at there is uh, the instructor's face in video lectures and what effect that face has on learner retention, cognitive load, feelings of social presence, and also embedding social cues in the platform, such as telling learners how many other learners are currently watching this video with them right now, uh, and what effect that has on the ways they, they see these, uh, the opportunity. Good, thank you. Um, thanks, yeah, and so some of the other work that uh, I've been doing with other collaborators in the Linux Lab is looking into some of the qualitative aspects of learner experiences. So we've been seeing a lot of data-driven investigations of how people engage with courses, and so we started doing some interviews with, with learners to see what their experience is like. Um, and we're writing that up in a paper right now, but one of the big things is sort of the invisible practices that aren't captured by the log data that really give context and meaning to people's participation in MOOCs. Um, and social aspects there, again, is a really big piece, both their uh, social, their interactions on platforms other than the MOOC platforms, and also their sort of in-person interactions with family and friends and others who are supporting their um, their participation in the course, which is also interestingly something we saw in our large-scale, large data investigation based on survey data and correlations of student activities that students who, um, who enrolled with other friends or colleagues in the course um, stayed really involved with the course. Um, and then sort of, Another thing that I'm really interested in is sort of tools to help learners construct their own knowledge in the courses, and this is, so I've started working on annotation and note-taking tools. If you're interested in that, come also to Phil and Leah's talk after this. Um, but basically, what can we build into the platform to help people um, make knowledge their own and also have conversations that are really directly attached to the text and to the other resources? So three seconds, two seconds, one second, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as the last speaker, John gets the rest of the hour. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right, yeah. So mine's actually not on active research because what I'm talking about is actually building an infrastructure to support re future research. Um, uh, I'm, one of my roles is as the data czar for UQX, and so uh, it was very important to me that for the University of Queensland, I deliver their maximum bang for buck or value out of the data that gets collected. So I wanted a nice infrastructure that uh, provided uh, the services from that data for the different audiences, such as upper management, course teams, and researchers. Um, so we're building uh, a system based upon the national research infrastructure, which is, oh, sorry. <coughs> Uh, we're building an infrastructure based on the national research infrastructure in Australia, which was intended to provide services for researchers to share data. So we're using that. Um, we're building this in similar sort of way to the way the edX platform works. So you'll be able to um, fork our Git repository and run the Ansible script and provision yourself a dashboard server um, that will be able to ingest uh, data from the data sources. So here, here are all our data sources. We have the primary ones from edX are the, the data dumps, but we also have a number of LTI tools that we run in our courses, which are hosted on our servers. Um, we also have Apache logs from the video downloads. Uh, we've, we, uh, the download link for all the videos, if someone doesn't want to watch on YouTube and downloads, comes from our server, so we can track all of those. Um, and we actually have an asset database um, which is created during the course design process. So we potentially in the future, when our uh, learning designers get their act together, uh, we'll actually have uh, information in there about the assets in the course, about why they're there, what their learning goals uh, were and so forth. We ingest all of this into uh, the data layer, which is uh, 10 terabytes of storage at the moment. And then we have a uh, processing server which has got a, a, a plug-in architecture that allows you to plug in ingesters that ingest the data into query databases, SQL or, or Mongo, and uh, processes that do uh, 
processing of the data, so things like changing IP addresses to countries, um, generating person course aggregate data sets uh, and so forth, and it saves those data sets back onto the storage. And then we have our dashboard, which is a set of plugins that do all of the different visualizations and provide the interface. So you go to the, the web page and you select the course, you select what visualization you want, and it either queries the databases or uses one of the derived data sets to present that. Um, and then the next step, so all of that's pretty much built and hopefully will be released in the next couple of weeks. Um, and the next step is to build the ad hoc query tools that allow researchers uh, that don't know what they're after um, to go in and, and do ad hoc queries on the databases and access these derived data sets directly. And zero seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I just want to take a quick, just to make a comment, to take, um, to have researchers who spent two years, uh, months to get to these results and tell them you have three minutes to present your findings. Um, you did a wonderful work, so a round of applause to them again as I, thank you. Um, and also to Russ Strader, who has been our tech um, AD over here. Thank you, Russ. Um, I want to invite the panelists up here to um, the chairs. Hopefully we have enough for all of you. Um, we'll scrounge up a few extras. And we wanted to allow a plentiful enough time for us to have an open dialogue. And I think actually John's presentation right there at the end, um, in some ways, was a nice way for those of you that might be new to MOOC research or have enjoyed um, over the last year to seeing the research that's um, emerging out of the MOOC space. Um, John's presentation, I think, is a nice illustration in some ways of the underbelly of what it takes to do <laughs> the work that a lot of the folks up here and a lot of you in the room um, have been undertaking. And I think it's fair to say that we're still in very early days. Um, I have one question for the panel to kick it off, and then I'm going to turn it over to you um, just from some ground rules like this morning. There are people floating around with microphones, so don't be shy. Um, the only thing I would ask you to do when you um, go to ask your question, introduce who you are so we know where you're from, and then also direct your question to you if it's for the full panel or a certain panelist. But real quickly, I'm curious for anyone who wants to take a stab at this, there's a microphone that you'll get to pass down. Um, what was... When you were going through to do your research, and I picked this off of the Twitter stream, actually, while you were all presenting, um, what were, and I don't want to get into a long policy conversation, but what words of wisdom might you have about the IRB process, maybe, for a lot of your colleagues? We talk about data collection, and John gave us a snapshot of that, but those of us who are undertaking research in this space, there's a lot of considerations. If any of you want to give, and I want you to give more advice, not necessarily to walk through this, the whole de gory details of IRB um, in this brave new world, but just advice or wisdom you might give folks who are interested in pursuing research in this space um, as they get this approved to their institutions. Anyone want to be bold? Go ahead, Renee from Stanford. Thanks, Megan. Yes, uh, the IRB. One, one, one piece of advice that I would really have uh, for people looking into this and working with the IRB is that the IRB is there to help you. And uh, it's most important to have an open conversation about what you're trying to get out of it and what the IRB has to offer you uh, on, on doing the right things. Uh, and and be, be really open and work together with the IRB instead of, instead of seeing it as an obstacle in the way of you doing your research. I think that that's the one piece of advice that I would have. So I think the really most important thing is that the instructors of the course have um, gone through the process up front in making sure that the data can be shared for research purposes. And also, um, it's very complicated because um, the providers have their data agreements. Sometimes universities kind of sign things without realizing what they're signing over, and they may not be fully aware. There's usually a data coordinator at the university who may not know. Then you have to get all these people on the same page. It ends up being a really, really long um, process. The one very successful case I can think of um, was really led by Norman Beer, who I believe is either here or he's a close collaborator with people who are here. He did it right, and he would be a great person to talk to. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Megan, do you have? I'll just keep running back and forth. And I would just add to that our team has um, 
done two IRBs, um, and I would say that the um, the design of um, whatever you're testing, that the instructional designer um, is working extremely close with um, the researcher so that you have every detail from the very beginning worked out with the instructor. Um, and in this case, Tiffany was fundamental um, in the design of it um, because she knew the content very well. Just like, and as Renee said, just like keeping in mind that it's, and you're, you're just trying to make sure that your students have the best learning experience that they can have. And so it's, a lot of it is common sense. And it's like, if, if you think that you would want to be in that situation, then it's probably, you know, um, like if, if you're trying to make it so that the learners can learn the best that they can. And so working closely with your IRB person to make sure that that's possible is um, beneficial for both of you. And I, I'm just going to add, to add one point. And one of the reasons why I asked that is just because um, I think MOOCs have presented an interesting opportunity. We got into this conversation just yesterday at Harvard. We had some folks over from Stanford and other universities. And this is a great, rich space that's very interdisciplinary. And so there are our social scientists and others that are very used to going through the IRB process. And there are other researchers that are getting more into this field in the data sciences and computer science that. Um, the institutional review board process is probably a little bit new as well. So it's more just something to be aware of. Um, Joseph, did you have something to add to this? Or <laughs> introduce yourself and. I am Joseph Williams. I'm at Stanford now and moving to Harvard X in September. But just to add a follow on, um, there's actually kind of an opportunity for a platform to shield you <laughs> from being in possession of information that puts you at risk and puts learners at risk. So. Um, Neil Heffernan, who's at Worcester Polytechnic, he runs Assistments, which is a platform that is, is kind of like a MOOC. It's for high school and community college, and it's actually something you can use to run experiments in MOOCs as well. But he actually got an NSF grant you know, on the advisory board for it, and a key part of it is that researchers can apply to run experiments, which he then embeds, but you actually never get any personal identifiable information. And so you actually can't really disclose learners' information, so it actually makes it a lot safer for learners and for you. So I'm not sure if that's something that MOOC platforms or universities could look into, but that's great because it actually, by blocking information from you, it protects you and protects learners. And another thing is that assessments then make sure that when you're running research, it has to be, uh, they do a clearance that it's gonna be instructionally effective. So it's not research just for the sake of research because it's practical. That actually also changes the kind of IRB that you're requesting. Thanks, Joseph. Other questions, um, follow-ons? It's in, I guess this is like the one. <laughs> oh, there's a mic right there. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Majerik. I'm from uh, the Center for 21st Century Universities at Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm the dedicated data controller for Coursera data, and I'm also the IRB designated person to write all of the IRBs for all of our MOOCs, and there are many. I want to make a comment about a consent form and an issue that we're facing. When we are writing consent forms, we really use language that's pretty practical, that allows the instructor, who is a, also a researcher, and I'm identified as a researcher on these protocols as well, access to the data over a period of time. But we're working on something right now, and I'll bring to your attention, is that the language that you use has to be a little bit more strategic. What about if someone from marketing wants to come and utilize your data to market that particular course? If that person's not on the consent form, it's going to be very difficult for marketing to get access to the data. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, it's practical language that we're using, and yes, you work with the IRB. They're very friendly and they're very helpful, but think about being a little bit more strategic. Who else would want to see that data at some point in time? Thank you. Questions? Go ahead, Adam. Over. Yes, I think uh, in thinking about these courses, one of the things we're all interested in engagement is engagement, the student engagement. But is focusing on students who drop out versus those who don't drop out really an effective way of getting at engagement? Given, especially in the case of fully open courses where students invest nothing into the course up front, um, students might have lots of different motivations for taking it. And I wonder if we're missing uh, the really interesting aspects of the data if we're just focusing on dropouts versus not dropouts. Um, I'll just give a short answer, and then I, I'm sure others have something to say about this. So um, I've heard this question come up over and over again. What we see is that there are several different kinds of 
students. There are those who are shopping around, and if they drop out, it's probably not a big deal. But we have a lot of evidence that there are students who fully intend to keep going in a course. They struggle, and they're just not able to overcome their struggles, and they drop out. And we see this in post-course surveys. We see this in what they talk about in the discussion forums, and we hear it from people um, offline as well. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish between those, to look for signs of struggle, and try to support those struggling students. And we can measure our success in terms of um, reductions in dropout rates, because it's one way of seeing, you know, did we help people overcome their struggles? But, um, but I, I think we shouldn't be too distracted by the fact that there is a lot of window shopping. Yeah, and I'll just say quickly, and to Sharif, because he's been addressing this, um, I think one, uh, one of the reasons this has been a big part of the conversation is because we've been trying to understand who do we, quote unquote, really care about? Who do we want to work to support? And who is it OK to um, sort of let go? And it's, it's problematic language, I agree. Um, but it's sort of where's the, especially when they're free courses, where's the responsibility of the instructor and of the platform to um, sort of help the entire population? Or can we? Can we divide up the population in a meaningful way to um, target feedback or target interventions um, that will help that specific group of students? So just sort of understanding that and sketching out the landscape has been a really important first stage in this research, and now I think we're moving beyond it. So I guess one, one other thing is uh, when a policymaker and an instructional designer talk about dropout, probably inside each of their heads they mean different things. So. Uh, uh, since there are many different definitions for dropout, then one you know, consequence of this is that basically different people are focusing on different type of behaviors or outcomes, undesirable outcomes. So you can imagine, for instance, I as an instructional designer might be interested in students who declare intention of viewing all of the videos and then seem to progress at a really low pace or just leave the course before completing half of the videos. That might be an interesting case. But for someone interested in not basically taking the final exam, for instance, but developing an ability to, you know, to have a, an effective and you know, an efficient conversation in the field with other people. So people looking for basically social engagement in the course, the, defi the definition of dropout, and consequently the research and everything underwards might be really different. Yeah. <clears throat> is, there, yeah. is there a question way up in the, cr like in the bright lights? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to quick add yeah. one point. Um, the, uh, dropping out is one measurement. It's one thing that we can look at uh, in these data sets, but it's really only one dimension. There's so many different outcomes that you could look at. Um, so I think that um, I think that an important part of the research process is to work with whoever's uh, collecting the data in order to design um, questions that can get at different outcomes that we care about, um, because. People take Coursera classes or any MOOC class for a whole range of, of motivations, and it's important to recognize the value and the different outcomes that they're pursuing. Thanks, John. Hi, I'm Maria Ginelli from the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and my question is for the folks from Penn. Uh, I am also wrestling with Coursera's data exports, and I am not doing it successfully. And so I'm wondering, um, how you ultimately did that. Did you have to hire somebody who had familiarity with the data? Did you work with the folks from Coursera? Um, how'd you do it? And are you sharing your SQL scripts? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't know how other universities handle it, but Penn has uh, someone that's specifically designated uh, as our liaison with Coursera. Um, so it's with this individual that we communicate, we put in requests and so forth. Um, in regards to the code, we have a, a, a tech team in the Department of uh, the Education School at Penn that does all of our MySQL stuff. And if you want to talk with uh, us after this conference, I'd be happy to share with you that contact and, and uh, I would encourage you to pursue that. And, and also I think there is a relation manager in Coursera and you can talk to because they are assigned in different universities with the one you want to talk to in terms of like the questions you have or like if you have like any type of concerns etc so that person would be very beneficial to your research as well
Yes, Stanford has, um, <clears throat> Andreas Pepke at Stanford is the data manager. He's been doing a great job in making the data more and more accessible. And we actually have an online, an online form now at Stanford where anyone from around the world can submit his or her idea for, for conducting research, what kind of data um, they would need for that research. And then these uh, requests are evaluated internally uh, and reviewed and uh, that is our process of sharing data with other researchers outside of Stanford. Um, just as a quick add-on, we also have a bunch of scripts and models that we would be willing to share um, from some of our published research on analyses of, of Coursera data. And um, so if people are interested, uh, we would pass on our papers. You could take a look at what we did. And if you're interested, we're happy to partner with you. Um, yeah, as, uh, at diversity, we also have um, lots of data and lots of <laughs> research um, ideas. So um, yeah, at the moment, I'm doing this. So if you have um, ideas or, um, or questions, um, you can just write me an email. I think uh, the email address popped up a lot of times there. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our peers has been stuff in the past. So uh, we have freely available scripts online. Oh, should I repeat everything? OK. Uh, hi, I'm Chinmay from Stanford. Uh, we worked with Coursera in the past on peer assessment. And we have uh, freely available scripts online on GitHub, uh, which will run uh, these scripts on your own data and make suggestions for things like, oh, yeah, this question was very confusing to everybody in your class. Maybe you should reword it. So we can create these data-driven suggestions uh, and the code is available online. Uh, and if you go to research.peerstudio.org, you can find it. Or you can just find me, and I'll uh, point you to it again. All right, thanks. Can I, can I actually add something to that? Sure, sure. Uh, at Stanford, we're also working uh, on developing the MOOCDB piping scripts for Coursera. And that implies you know, some data science techniques to basically filter the data and clean it up. And MOOCDB basically provides you know, Coursera data in a format that is uh, really, uh, you know, very easy to deal with. So if you're also interested, you know, reach out to me. We are preparing pilots for people interested in working with Coursera data under MOOCDB. All right, we have one Colin down here. Thank you. A very different question. Cormac McGrath from Karolinska Institute. Uh, so this is a question for the diversity people. We're going to be publishing a course come spring in a randomized controlled trials, and we were hoping to build it around a peer assessment. So you kind of broke my bubble with your presentation. Um, at the same time, uh, your results sort of contradict a lot of the research out there, which shows a very high inter-rater reliability between students and teachers and teachers and teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm curious, do you think uh, your findings have got something to do with it being MOOC specific, or are you onto something here? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's um, really MOOC specific. I mean, it's not, um, yeah, I mean, we had this, uh, we had the peers that um, also exists offline. We had um, pro graders, so like teaching assistants and, um, and a professor. So. Um, yeah, and what was the, the first question actually before? There was only one question, I think. Um, so there seem, there's a lot of research to suggest that there's a very high inter-rater reliability. But your, suggest, or your results suggest that, in this case anyway, there wasn't almost any. Exactly. So I think the, um, the, um, these high correlations exist if you, um, if you apply more, uh, more fancy algorithms and, and methods um, to, the, um, to the grading. So there are the machine learning methods, or um, I think there's a paper from Coursera where, where a lot of um, statistics is applied. But we were really applying it to a, to a basic model of peer grading where just uh, five people um, grade me, I grade five people, and then in the end we take something like the average, but without um, taking into account all this, um, all this biases and trying to, trying to fix this problem. Because we were thinking that um, before trying to fix this with uh, fancy algorithms, we should uh, think what we want to opt optimize for. Is, it, is there really such a thing as a true grade? And who's determining it? Is it the professor, or are there three grades? like? Um, one from the professor, one from peers, one from teaching assistants. So we wanted to do this first and then apply more advanced methods. I guess no. I'll give up the mic. I, I, just All a right. closing Here's comment then. I don't think that surely the answer question. isn't in the algorithms to peer assessment. 
Sorry? And my question was, and I'll let the question go now, but I'm just curious, when you inflate the, or you scale up a MOOC to so many people, then maybe people aren't invested in giving good feedback. And that's the question I'd like, or that's the issue I'd like to talk more about, but not here because I think my time's up. So thanks. <laughs> Laura, do you Hi. have something it, to add on to that? It's something directly yeah. related. Ahead, Laura. Uh, Laura Weiner from McGill University. I'm just wondering what kind of rubrics were being used by the TAs, by the profs, by the peers? Um, that's my question. Yeah, so um, like the profs uh, or the prof, um, the peers and the pros used the same rubrics and there were five um, criteria. Um, there was one on um, sourcing like citation, how well did they do in that area? Then there was one related to content, of course. Then another one was um, whether the argumentation was balanced. And um, the fourth one was um, about um, the, the, the general, like, is there a thesis? But we also found that <laughs> one issue is that they performed very good um, in the content part, but whenever it came to um, methods, applying like the method of writing a scientific essay, they um, perform very poorly. And this is basically because, I mean, they're so, the, the audience is so diverse and they have different backgrounds. And we assume that a lot of them have never taken a course on scientific writing. So they were completely overwhelmed with this task. So um, this is something that we found very interesting and that we would like to um, look at even closer. Because, you know, one is like teaching content, the other thing is teaching methods. And we found that that was a gap in this course. We have time for one more question, and I believe there's been someone so waiting patiently. So this is patiently. more of a suggestion than, a, than okay. a question, maybe. But Rebecca, it would be great if you could maybe, sorry, Margaret Schadel yeah. from Stony yeah. Brook, back to the data and exporting sure. from Coursera. We also had a, a bit of a nightmare with that, but then everything worked out. Um, but it would be great if somewhere on the website for this conference, sure. if you, maybe you could collect the sites and the algorithms and the things that at least the panel discussed. Um, I think that would be super useful sure. for everyone. We'll figure that out. I'm looking at Candace and Ross. Definitely, that's a great suggestion. And I actually wanted to comment. I know, Candace, you mentioned this morning, there is, I think, up at the registration desk also a sign-in sheet for um, the broader research community. So we're trying to get together a mailing list as well. So all of you that are here, you know, we're going old school, but very reliable technology, actually. People still like their email. Um, I know I do. I'm not completely on Twitter all the time. Um, but this is a good, the idea through this is to build community, continue the conversation from this, and to share also, not only put it on the website, but as things come up, to share these valuable resources. Um, like Coursera edX also has resources on Git as well. Um, all of the providers, I, I know Olga, if you want to know more about that, I'm going to point out Olga sitting right there who's waving. Um, she can talk to you a little bit more about what our, the analytics team at edX has been working on as well. Um, but overall, I just want to take the time to, i just realizing that we're coming to a close. Any final thoughts from the panelists other than I want to commend you all for um, being able to do your research talk in three minutes. Um, and also all of you for being here and having a great conversation. Um, there, feel free to come up. Um, I think people will linger a little bit. If you have any individual questions for the panelists, feel free to come up. We have a break for the next half hour before the next session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. <laughs>